everybody, and uh, welcome to the Strand. My name is Peter, and I'll direct the events here. Uh, for a little bit of history, the Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on what was then 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor still run by the Bass family, running 400 events a year, and still housing new and used books. Tonight, I am very excited to have with us Judy Ann Nock to celebrate the release of the Modern Wishcraft Guide to Magical Herbs, her brand new and comprehensive compendium to the many methods and practices of herbal magic. Judy is the author of several other books, including the Modern Witchcraft Book of Natural Magic, A Witch's Grimoire, and several others. The last one was actually translated into French as well. Her work has appeared in Publishers Weekly, Bust Magazine, Hello Giggles, and Bustle, uh, among many others, and she performs regularly with the critically acclaimed Hoboken Cave Punk Supergroup, known as Psycho Positive. Joining her to discuss her work is Debbie Schwartz, a psychic reader with over 15 years of experience and as well a com an accomplished performer, having released two solo albums on Twin Lakes and Mercury Records, as well as singing lead and playing guitar with the Aquanetas and being the bass player for PG6. I am very thrilled to have them with us here tonight, so please, without further ado, join me in welcoming them to the stream. release and launch of my fourth book, The Modern Witchcraft Guide to Magical Herbs. Woo! <laughs> so, um, we were talking a bit about, about magic, herbalism, what it means to be a modern witch, and, um, and then we'll take some questions too for uh, your curiosity's sake. Okay, I think, I think what we were going to start with was um, a recent article in the New York Times. Well, that sounds like a fine place to start. Let's start. So, um, after about 10 years of publishing books on witchcraft, someone finally noticed, and, <laughs> which was amazing. And um, so, a wonderful writer named Jessica Bennett wrote an article in the New York Times titled, When Did Everybody Become a Witch? <laughs> and for me, this was a fascinating question and really exciting to explore. And um, when I saw that my, uh, my latest book was mentioned in it, it was a, it was a thrilling moment. But um, the overall tone of the article seemed to be implying that we were now like saturated. You know, like witch had somehow uh, jumped the shark. Or, um, and then, then the print version came out and it said, um, no need for a hunt uh, because we're awash in witches. And I thought, what a beautiful, sensual image to be like awash in witches, and what a wonderful thing that must be. So then, my question then became, where do I fit into all this? So if I answer that question for myself personally, when did I become a witch? Does that mean when you come into your awareness of feminine power? Does it mean when you actually acknowledge that this is a tradition? Because witches have been around for over 5,000 years. You can trace back the earliest of civilizations to goddess worshippers. And when I first figured this out, it was mind-blowing. And so this was late 80s, early 90s. I couldn't figure out why everyone else's minds didn't seem to be blown. So we have a plethora of um, male gods and patriarchal images that we're inundated and we're saturated with them. They're in our pores, they're in our minds, it's how we define ourselves, it's how we relate to the world and to society, and oftentimes like a woman's power kind of depends on her attachment to a powerful man. And one of my early discoveries happened to be in um, the American Museum of Natural History. And I was looking at these um, Neolithic sculptures, and they were so obviously goddesses. These were important. People created these because they had power, and they were relegated to um, fetishes and fertility charms in some dark little corridor. Like, oh, and by the way, 
we think people used to worship the goddess. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like, this is, this is kind of huge. This led me to kind of like question the whole uh, societal construct that we all participate in. So, um, so yeah, when I think of that question, when did everybody become a witch? I'm like, when, when was everybody not a witch? You know, and what does it mean to be a witch? I think of it as like an acronym for women in total control of herself. You actually, it's, oh, I'm gonna drop things all night, sorry. Drop. You actually addressed this at the beginning of the grimoire. Yes, that's true, because that was like a major source of uh, inspiration. So the grimoire was uh, my first book that I wrote in 2005. Because I was reading Time it on travel. the subway on the way over, and I was like, whoa. She is awakening, and you cannot deny the strength of her presence. You seek to know her, to learn of her great mysteries, to walk the path of those who honor her. You thirst for the knowledge of what came before, before our modern world became so unbalanced. You have discovered the goddess she has found you. She has called out your name from the dark recesses of your mind. She has called you to herself. She is the source from which all creation emanates. You feel amazed that she has been there all along, but you've never known her name until now. She was called Isis by the Egyptians, Inanna by the Sumerians, Ishtar in Babylon. So those are some examples, right, of these um, female archetypes that I gain a lot of inspiration from. Yeah. Talk about, um, well, talk about what was going on when you wrote this book, because there was a very specific life event happening for you while you were writing this book, I believe. Uh, yes, that is true. And um, Debbie and I have known each other for about Ever. two and a half decades, <laughs> at least 25 years. And uh, when I talk about magic and how magic informs my life, I think of magic as um, a series of controlled coincidences that we combine thought, word, and deed. So, and my friend Dr. Ann Gava is here and we had a recent conversation about the concept of acting in accord. So acting in accord is you focus your intention, you inject your intention into the field, what you want to happen, and then you follow up with all the things you have to do to make it so. And if you do those three things, your magic is pretty good. It's pretty strong. You can't just like, you know, light a candle, whisper an incantation, and expect everything to work out and go to plan. You can't just really think it into being. But if you combine like that thought, that action, and that word, then you're starting to get in touch with magic. So the life event um, that was happening surrounding the beginning of this journey um, as an author was that I found myself in um, facing an interesting challenge. And I feel that this challenge is somewhat uniquely specific to womanhood, where I was pregnant with my first child, I was facing an unpaid maternity leave from work, and I had a partner who was navigating a catastrophic illness. So I went from this, you know, kind of comfortable, um, lower middle class existence of, um, basically I went from $70,000 a year to welfare in the space of a few short months. Um, so then the life event became, how am I gonna pay my rent in February? You know, I don't have a job, I have a newborn in my arms, and I have a very sick person. Um, that I need to care for. And um, so this is where the magic stepped in and just like caught me as I was about to fall off the precipice. Um, back in the late 80s when I became a witch, I used to uh, commune, circle, have coven, enact rituals with like-minded individuals. And when I moved to New York, I was kind of looking to recreate that and I didn't find um, a situation that I could join and be a part of. So I kind of started my own. And I got a little bit of notoriety for this. So it was like kind of like a very personal thing, but it was a very personal thing that was kind of salacious and interesting that I was somewhat uh, known for. 
So um, a friend of mine who was an author was having lunch with her literary agent, and her literary agent was moaning and groaning a little bit about how, gosh, if I had someone that could write for the New Age market or Wicked books, I'd keep them busy for the next 10 years. And she was like, I know somebody. So she called me up and she was like, you need to get a proposal uh, to my agent like now, like yesterday. And I was like, okay. Um, I've never written anything longer than a college term paper in my life, but here we go. So, um, you know, lucky for me that um, there was this weird aspect to my personality that had gotten a little bit of attention. I had been on the cover of The Village Voice, like back in the 90s, so I had that. So I had a little, like, press nugget. I had years of occult experience, and, you know, I want to call it luck, but I have to call it magic. The proposal that I wrote matched their acquisition order for the book they were seeking to publish. So that was a slam dunk. It's like, okay, well, we've already advertised this. We need to contract author work for hire. I needed to pay my rent in February. And they said, you have 90 days. <laughs> <laughs> I was working 60 hours a week in my second trimester of pregnancy, and I said, okay, okay. And that's how it started, was the word and the deed and that background of magic, and then just like stepping into that field, putting that intention, having the universe like hear it, match it, and then walking through the door and saying, okay, we're gonna do this. And one of the things that gave me a lot of strength during that kind of tumultuous time was the fact that in these years of celebrating the cycle of seasons, and in this time of magic and music, we'd been keeping track. We had like a grimoire, a book of shadows for like every year, and I thought, well, that's natural. Gosh, you know, I've collaborated on at least half a dozen, and if I get stuck, if I get writer's block, I'll just look at what I've been doing for the past 10 years, and I never did. I never went back, I never had to look back, which was amazing, but I think just having that gave me the strength, like knowing that I could do it. So that's how this crazy magical journey got started. It was just like, kind of a fluke, you know? I mean, I don't know how else to explain it, so I just say magic. Well, it just felt like the grimoire itself, the way you have the whole how-to, this is how you make the book, this is how you set your intention, this is how you purify yourself. It's like you're reconstructing your life along new lines. You know what I mean? Yeah, yes I do. It's a very, very much a how-to, and um, one of the interesting things about the work I've been doing um, in publishing was there were tons and tons and tons of like Wicca 101 books and Witchcraft 101 books, but there wasn't really a lot for intermediate practitioners, maybe people that had been involved for a while and were looking to next level or people that had already had an established practice and wanted to add something. So I thought, well, I can definitely do that. And that, that was hard. It was really hard um, to be on that shelf with you know, all of the primers, to have like an intermediate book where people were you know, getting it and expecting one thing that was like, whoa, you really need at least some kind of background in this. They're not beginner books. Except for this one, my first primer is a great introduction to herbs. So yeah, yeah. came out today, I believe. Today, today, today. Ta -da. Talk about your other books. So you started with the um, grimoire. So yes. this is how you keep a diary. So you, I, I'm assuming that you see that as the touch point, the basis. Well, it is because um, because the grimoire is interesting because anyone can have one. And in traditional witchcraft, this was like where all the secret spells were kept and only like, it was like a members only, like black book. And um, usually um, back in the, um, gosh, it's really sad because it's, I'm going to talk about a 400 year span in, um, in women's history from about, yeah, like 1300s to 1700s, 1800s, there was a lot of persecution. So putting your name on something, writing plainly was dangerous. Life-threateningly dangerous. 
So uh, grimoires are traditionally secret. Um, so that was the first book. The second one was uh, Wheel of the Year, which I have a copy of. I'll show you that one because it's pretty. Wheel of the Year um, was, this is an extremely magical book. And um, so Wheel of the Year looks like this. And um, the front of the, the whole wheel is cut off. You only see a couple. You see Samhain and Yule and Imbolg, and you don't see um, the rest. But there's basically eight points on the wheel. And um, so the rumor I wrote during the uh, second trimester of my first um, and only successful pregnancy, and then the wheel of the year I wrote um, while I was chasing a toddler around. So that was super fun. So most of the book was written between like 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. So it has like a very uh, celestial um, kind of uh, feel to it. It's, it's dark, not in the sense of like a dark energy, but it's dark in the sense that it talks a lot about the stars, it talks a lot about astrology, it talks a lot about astronomy. Because what I really wanted to do is put um, the Wheel of the Year in context for people that are marking the seasonal celebrations today. So um, how many of us like to read our horoscopes? We like that? Yeah, me too. So, but there's this phenomenon called the procession of equinoxes, where on the tilt of the Earth, we have that 23 degree angle, but there's a little wobble to it. So the pole star changes, and the celestial sphere, so if you think of the equator of the Earth, and you imagine that projected into the night sky, that is the, um, the via solis, the celestial equator, what we perceive to be the path of the sun through all the constellations of the zodiac. And there's some really big constellations that didn't even make it into the zodiac, like you know, poor Ophiuchus, who's like right next to Scorpio, which is like a million times bigger, sun's hanging out for like a good two months in Ophiuchus, but no one says they're Ophiuchus. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why? So, and then I'm Libra, the only inanimate object in the, uh, in the zodiac, and, uh, and I wasn't even a thing. Like, Libra used to be the um, claws of the scorpion. And then it was like, eh, maybe not. Maybe we'll separate that. So you've got big ones, small ones, and nobody knows why. But when you look at that uh, celestial equator projected against the sphere of the heavens, and you take into account procession, the sun is not even in those constellations at those times anymore. So it's weird because I read like my astrological profile for Libra and that is so me, but that is so not where the sun was when I was born. So go figure, by procession of equinoxes, I should be a Virgo and I am so not. <laughs> so it's hard to explain, but um, these are thought forms that we all participate in. And so I'm gonna bring it back to magic. When we have that like amazing group participation it becomes real for us. It gains power when we all believe in it, the same way like a spell gains power or a prayer gains power, and it's combining that intention, the word, and the deed. So, so the Wheel of the Year was my second book. That was written around, I think, 2006 and came out in 2007. And um, then it got kind of quiet because then nobody was a witch anymore, and we just fell off the face of the earth and like, nobody cared and like we had our moment and then you know there's this whole weird like marketing thing that goes on so uh, there were still witches yeah but the big buzzword then was like wicca you know and now like witchcraft is in and, and wicca is out which is kind of funny to me too so um are they not the same thing well, that is a topic of debate. So what I'm seeing now in our, um, you know, dawning 2020 decade is, and I'm, I'm partly excited by it, I'm partly bemused by it, <coughs> and maybe even like slightly hurt by it. But we have this generation of um, rising witches that disavow the past, 
which is fine. I have no problem with uh, iconoclasts. But in this like deconstruction and this effort to reinvent and reclaim and rename their own power, this disavowal is creating kind of like a disconnect like in the neo-pagan community. So we have like this one camp that uh, swears that witchcraft is a religion and a practice. And then another camp that swears that it is not, that it is a lifestyle. And it has more to do with um, what tea you drink and, and what you wear. And you can ascribe <laughs> candles that have absolutely nothing to do with any higher power. You know. Well, yeah. A lot of, but what is our society? We live in a very consumerist uh, society. Well, it's I think like, that's something that's imposed from above. Oh, the people like... You know, I, mean, I mean, witchcraft as a lifestyle, I, I kind of see it as something that's being imposed down upon us. Like, we got to sell something. Okay, you're a witch. Buy this candle, buy this yeah. oil, buy this self-help book. Sure. You're not writing self-help books. Oh, that's a good question. Am I writing self-help books? Well, they're full of history. They're, they're not written, they're not 101 books. No, there's, there's history, <laughs> there's lore, there's uh, context. You, you do your homework. And there's, but there's a lot of practical stuff. So, you know, for someone like me that's been um, an occult practitioner for over 30 years, it's like, you know, um, Yule rolls around again, you're like, oh, what are we going to do? And so it's just like, you know, a, a new recipe or, you know, just things to do, you know, to share with your beloved. So it's coming from a heartfelt place and a place of practice. So um, most of the books contain my more uh, successful experiments. Didn't write about the ones that didn't work out. But, you know, between like every effective, you know, oil blend, there's, you know, 10 journal entries of me going, no, yuck, you know, like, <laughs> sounded like a good idea, but no. <laughs> yeah, gotta try things, be bold. Let, let's shift gears into the um, more spiritual realm and talk a bit about which mm -hmm. goddesses you dedicated to. Oh, gosh, okay, this is um, gonna get like super personal. So, um, as I said before, there is a little bit of a division in the camps of what it means to be a witch today. So, I am not framing this in any other way besides my own personal experience. So, when we think of witchcraft in a spiritual sense, we're basically thinking about three things. And the three things that we think about are the feminine archetypes of maiden, mother and crone. So when I think of, of the pantheon of goddesses, um, when you prepare you know, for an initiation, you're encouraged to reflect on these archetypes and see which ones um, resonate with you. So during my uh, preparation in days of yore, and some of the things when I say preparation, it involves scholarship. You have to read and you have to study. Um, it involves a lot of trance meditations where you just try to empty your mind and then interpret images that come to you, speak with an elder or someone that can help you um, interpret that energy when you're a neophyte or an initiate. And then there's also, um, you know, personal gnosis, which is your own um, <coughs> understanding of who you are. So coming into my own understanding, I dedicated to uh, three goddesses. The first is the uh, Babylonian goddess Ishtar. What drew me to Ishtar primarily was um, her physicality. So she is most often depicted in a breast offering pose where she's got these enormous, just voluptuous hips. And um, she's, holding, she's holding her breasts in her hands. And um, she often appears with this um, I'm not sure the, the source quote, but when I see Ishtar, she's often accompanied by the words, the fate of everything she holds in her hands. And I would look at this image and I would think, well, you know, she's, she's holding her breasts in her hands. So what does that mean? Like the fate of everything if she's holding her breasts? I'm like, because it's our responsibility to the planet to not just bring forth life, but to nurture it. And whatever that means for you, however you nurture life, whether it's a plant or an animal or a child or a creative endeavor, it's not enough to bring it into an existence. It's not enough to manifest things. 
you have to sustain it. And so that spoke to me in the um, flowering of my youth. Um, the second goddess that I studied and um, dedicated to uh, was the god of, goddess uh, Bridget, who is um, a Celtic goddess, very, very powerful. Um, Bridget has a triple aspect of healing, poetry, and metalsmithing. So in preparation for um, my dedication to Bridget, um, it's customary to uh, present offerings. So my offering when I was a little baby metalsmith was this beautiful pentacle crown. And um, it used to have a little crescent moon on it, but that broke off ages ago. So um, how I express myself to Bridget is with Smithcraft. And how I came into uh, Smithcraft was um, it helped me integrate a very uh, visceral grief where I was in the throes of a terrible morning, having just lost um, a woman that I love dearly um, to death. And um, she was a jeweler and a mouse smith, and I literally picked up a torch in her honor and said, you can't do this anymore. I'm still here, I'll do this for you. And it's brought me to some amazing places, and I've met some incredible people through that um, creative endeavor. And also in her aspect of poet, writing is also um, emblematic of Bridget. And then, so my, <laughs> my third and final goddess <laughs> archetype was uh, Hecate the Crone, because um, I didn't know a lot of old women. I just didn't. Like, I knew my grandma. She was kind of mean. <laughs> and um, as women, we were like, you know, we have it drilled into our brains that like youth and beauty is the way to go and I thought how am I going to survive this life if I can't embrace this so I took like one of the things that I had been trained to fear the most and embraced it so um, one of the amazing things about this book coming out this year is I just turned 50 and so so I'm like baby crone right and I'm like waiting for uh, for that to set in, and it, and it feels great, and I think that has a lot to do with Hecate, and just, you know, not just not just facing your fears, but kind of like embracing them and integrating them, like it doesn't mean that you're not afraid, it just means that you're going powerfully forward in spite of your fear, so. Um, can we have a time check? Anybody got the time? 20 up? Okay. Um, want to ask, I, I had another question. Okay, so we're going to do a couple more questions, and then uh, we're going to do um, some questions, if you all have any questions. And then, um, and then I will have a question for you. <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> well, you know, talking about the goddess, talking about women's power, I wanted to know how you felt, or what you felt was sort of the intersection between witchcraft and feminism. Oh, I feel so conflicted. I feel so conflicted because the kids today don't even want to own feminism. Like, my own daughter said to me, you know, I'm not a feminist. And I was like, well, the hell you aren't. You know, you want a debit card? Yes, you are. And I just had to explain it to her because, like, my head exploded. <laughs> what are women? Mean? Young women are really And then I see girls, I see, like, the, like the edgy, tough girls, like, we are the granddaughters of the witches you couldn't burn. And I'm like, well, unless you're talking about your great, 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 she happened to be from Scotland because we hung witches. I guess that doesn't sound as edgy. Like, there were no witches burned here. So, like, what's she talking about? Girl, I don't get you. I guess that sounds edgy and cool. But, yeah, so that intersection of, oh, this is hard. I'm going to talk about it. It's an assault on It's Yeah, and it's just like, why, why does the witch have to be ugly? Why is she green? Why is she unappealing? Is it because she has to be ugly for her to have power? Because women aren't allowed to have it unless they're ugly? Like, yeah, we gotta fix this, people. It makes me think of Helen of Troy, you know, <laughs> the face that launched a thousand ships. Because I mean, she was desirable to men, she was because desirable if to you men. can capture the male gaze, then, you know, yeah, yeah, then you launch a thousand ships. What if you want to launch those ships on your own and break new ground on your own? Can you, do you have to be ugly? Yeah, burn you on the mask. Yeah, yeah maybe. Happen. Mostly, 
when people talk about taking power away from witches and witch hunts, it's because they, they want something. It's an oppressive, it's an oppressive act. Either you're too young or you're too old, you're too ugly or you're too sexy, or your cow's doing better than my cow, or your field's doing better than my field, or things aren't going right for me, so it's, it's got to be you, because what else could it be? And so um, I feel that in my heart of hearts, I believe, I truly believe, that the sun shines on all of us and that you know we don't need that that competition of we don't need you know we don't need the witch hunt and especially if you read the New York Times we're washing witches we don't need the hunt <laughs> <laughs> we're washing witches we're washing witches and you know the wheel of the year is turning we're coming up on solstice yes we are yes we are whether you celebrate solstice. Christmas solstice whatever um, I was thinking it would be nice to talk about this book in terms of preparing for the solstice. Okay, so um, so this book has some really great ideas on how to prepare for the winter solstice. A couple of things I want to say, and um, in the spirit of full disclosure, since I've revealed so much, um, I was raised Catholic, so that has a lot to do with uh, where my love of ritual comes from. And I mean no disrespect whatsoever to the uh, archetypes of Christianity. However, if you read the nativity story and you understand that the angel first appeared to the shepherds with glad tidings of great joy, you would know that in the dead of winter, there is no shepherd that is driving his sheep out to graze. So, like, if you have a working understanding of sheep and grass, <laughs> it doesn't take a lot to understand that the the archetype that we worship as Jesus Christ was not born at the winter solstice. Like, just straight up wasn't. <laughs> Most likely, that happened in the spring. Most likely, that happened in the spring. Um, and just like I said, I was um, a devotee of the goddess Bridget, and a couple versions she pops up in the nativity story as a midwife to the Christ child, and she was also a blind nun from Ireland in alternate time. So if you have a sense of transportation, general reality, you know that, that uh, we celebrate the winter solstice, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Yule because it is powerful, because it is the longest night because it is our time to reflect and be quiet and revel in the beauty of the night sky. All the brightest stars are in the winter sky. All the first magnitude stars, not all of them, but the majority of them. The stars seem brighter because they actually are. And um, the winter solstice uh, festival predates Christianity by thousands of years. It was celebrated in Rome as Saturnalia, uh, Sol Invictus, Yule, this is, um, this is ongoing. So if you're wondering why we decorate trees, it's because the great battle between the Oak King and the Holly King is the exchange of power. So the year is born anew, the days will begin to lengthen, the holly king of the waning year will surrender his crown, and the sun is reborn. So that's how I'll be celebrating the winter solstice, uh, with uh, orange pomanders and cloves and uh, mulling spices and evergreen boughs and stuff like that, too. So. That was really beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I think we have time for some questions now. Yes. We'll pass the mic. I'll pass the mic. Oh, I'll pass, pass the, mic. the mic. I feel like Bill Donahue. <laughs> so do you have to be a woman to be a witch? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Can you talk a little bit about like witchcraft as a femininity based thing and how it shakes down with other genders? Okay, so so we're talking about uh, witchcraft and gender neutrality. And um, the way most occult practitioners that I know describe themselves um, three ways. Witches, wizards, and warlocks. I'm not making this up. Male, now I'm serious. Males tend to claim those titles more, and um, some of the most 
uh, powerful wishes that I've met in the last couple of years were met. And um, very, very devoted, very, very reverent. Um, some people that come to mind are uh, Michael Herkus, who I met in New Orleans, who just uh, published a book called The Glam Witch, uh, G-L-A-M, which stands for uh, Greater Lilithian Arcane Mysteries. Um, and then Christian Day, who puts on uh, a couple annual events at Omen in Salem, Massachusetts, and um, Hexfest, also in New Orleans. I'm from originally from the Southeast, so a lot of the people I know come from there. And um, But the interesting thing about the men that I know that practice witchcraft is that they still devote to the goddess archetype. They still devote to the goddess archetype. The majority from my experience. So great question, thank you. Anybody? Is, okay. is witchcraft always about honoring a goddess? Or is it is that more of like an umbrella? So that's a great question, because there's a lot of uh, 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 controversy surrounding that. But um, typically, what's different about uh, witchcraft is that, well, first of all, the feminine aspect of deity is recognized. You know, like, that's actually a thing. But um, the goddess almost always appears with a male consort. So the emphasis is on the feminine, but the god aspect is in no way excluded. It's just not emphasized, if that makes sense. But I know some people are uh, consider themselves witches who are really into like gemology and not so much uh, a worshiping of the goddess. Right, so I'm seeing like a really uh, huge uptick in the interest of what I've come to call secular witchcraft which is uh, more uh, practice-based. It's, um, it's a practical magic. It's about a lot of the things you described, using crystals for healing, vibrational energy, using herbs, of course, and it's not really connected with um, the spiritual aspect. It's a, very, it's a secular practice, very empowering though, so I don't discourage it. I think people are free to explore and assume the identities that express their true selves assuming your book can be used for those people as well. Well, you know, that's an interesting fact, because when I started publishing, um, you know, Wicca was the big buzzword, and now like, books, bookstores have told me, yeah, we, don't, we won't even carry a book that says Wicca on it. So, okay, so that's a thing. That's weird. Yeah, that's, but it's, it's true. Like, that is when I, um, when I was trying to uh, promote natural magic, I had uh, two other titles. One was The Witch's Grimoire, and the other was The uh, Providence, Pre uh, Providence Press Guide to the Wiccan Year. And uh, Wiccan Year got you know, a solid thumbs down because of the wrong W word, because it fell, it fell out of fashion. You know? So the, the secular witchcraft, is the interest is on the rise. <laughs> but um, the spiritual side of it has been around for at least five millennia, to my knowledge, and it's not going to go away. But as more people, you know, discover it, then it, it feels new, it seems new. So, yeah, secularism, I think, is um, it's very much, very much a thing. The question over here. What's one of the most profound things that you have discovered from these potions that you put in your book? Okay, um, so the most profound Thing that I have discovered is how little I know about this. <laughs> there are over 15,000 different varieties of herbs, from <clears throat> tonics to restoratives, um, poisons. Oh my gosh. I wrote about 100. I picked like 100 out of 15,000. Like so many decisions. It was such a gift to be able to pursue my interest, but you know, the most profound thing that I came up against was even in 30 years of study, I know shit. <laughs> so that's my honest answer. Yeah. And then the um, second part to that question is, what, what results did you see? Like, What was the most interesting or impactful result that you saw from these potions? Okay, so the most impactful result from a potion 
um, was definitely a love potion that I made. And love is almost like, um, in witchcraft we make jokes and we call it like the goddess's calling card. That's what draws most people to the craft is that um, manipulative impulse. That's not what I do. So um, the ancient Greeks had at least seven different words for love. There's filial love, there's familial love, there's self-love, erotic love, romantic love. So even when you start thinking about love, you have to think about this very, very deeply. So, um, so the last potion I made that brought about this feeling of love in such a profound way started with the intention. So the intention started with the ingredients. Um, growing outside my window was a fragrant rose bush that had two perfect roses in full bloom, two on the same stem. So I started with a double rose and made an offering and asked permission to the plant. And, and I cut those roses, but I kept them together. And I put them in a jar and I covered them with sunflower oil. And this was at midsummer, this was on Letha, like the height of, you know, when the oak king. So, anyway, we already talked about that. So the sun, so that was that energy too. It was like an energy of culmination, of fruition, and then sealed it tight so that no air could get in, and then decorated it with this beautiful rose quartz obelisk, and I let it sit for about three months. So then when I unscrewed the jar, I was welcomed by the memory of the double rose, the beauty of a summer that had passed, and this infusion of rose and sunflower that was quite delightful. So then the next step was filtering it because the uh, plant material starts to break down and it can get to be a little cloudy. So then it became about um, you know, sterilizing the jars, making sure everything's clean, uh, pouring off the infused oil and going, well now I have an excellent base. Now what am I gonna do with it? So that's when I talked earlier about injecting intention into the field. Two things I wanted was that fruition of love, so I put little rose quartz chips directly in the potion. And then I put in quartz crystal for clarity. And then I went on a search for the most perfect and pure, dried, organic rosebuds that I could find, which I found at Flower Power on the Lower East Side. So if you go there, yep. really good stuff. So for like, you know, you can get like an ounce for, it wasn't even $10, you know what I mean? Yeah. So and then, and then thinking about um, how many, you know, then experiencing their life cycle, and then putting them in tiny jars, and then putting the oil on top of it, and then um, amplifying it a little bit. So when I speak of amplifying, I mean like adding other distilled oils to make the potion. So in that case, I used um, a little bit of sandalwood for grounding, kind of as a base note, and then a little bit of lavender for calming, which I love, and then, and then I got really excited because I could feel it, you know, I could feel. Oh, and I poured it off on a full moon too, full moon in Libra, so that's a good time of balance. So it was just like infused with like astrological, celestial, elemental energy, so it was very much attuned with um, earth, air, oil, love, heart song, time, darkness, it was, it was perfect. And then I thought, what I really need to do is share these, because they're so good. So I did my first ever Instagram giveaway. <laughs> I gave away five. Christine won one. Yeah. So now you know the story of your little potion. Now you know. I love it even more. So some of the things you can do with it is you can um, you can touch it to your heart. It's it's safe to wear. You can um, you can anoint surfaces with it. You can change the energy of a room with it. You can Im imbue the energy of an object. I mean that. Yeah, so on your person, on your stuff, in your home, or just when you need a little pick-me-up. Yeah, so it's a really good love potion. But what that love means to you, that's, that's your intention. The, the base is there, and it's clear, and it's pure. So, yeah, that would probably be the most profound, most profound potions, the most recent one, because we're constantly learning, you know. Any other questions? Good job, maybe one or two more. Hi. Hi. 
question is, how did you know that you were rich? How did I know? Oh my God! How did I know? Well, one day you were. Oh you no! Were. Yes, yes, yes. That's an amazing question because I already confessed that I was raised in the Catholic faith, and I noticed that at around eight years old that I was different from the other kids because when the other kids went out to recess, I went to church and I knelt at the statue of Mary and I prayed. And I brought her offerings, wildflowers that I gathered in the schoolyard, not understanding what I was doing, having this innate feeling that the image of Mary was the mother of God, and that was actually important to me. And then I noticed that she's standing on a snake. And I said, Sister Rosa Amelia, why is the Virgin Mother standing on a snake? And she said, because Mary is pure and she crushes evil. And I was like, okay, I go back. The snake's not crushed. The snake is not a crushed snake. I mean, we've got a gory crucifix. Clearly, clearly, the rendering of the mortal coil is not something that we Catholics shy away from. I've been to South America. I've seen hundreds of bloody saints. They don't hold back. So why was this snake living? Why was it depicted as living? So, question. So, eight-year-old Judy Ann goes to the library, discovers Greek mythology, that the snake is a symbol of wisdom, that she's not crushing the snake. She is one with the snake. That is her totem. That is her emblem. So then I started questioning Sister Rose Amelia <laughs> and some of the things I've been taught. And I went to the little candle shop in the mall. By the time I was 10, I had saved up enough babysitting money to have my very own statue of Mary, which I just, oh, I loved her. Oh, I wanted her so bad. Hours of babysitting. Brought her home. I put her on a mirror for some weird reason. Bought a little, uh, plastic like candle wreath from the mall, put it on her head. I was like crowning the May Queen. I had this idea that she was gonna like things that smelled good, so I would leave little perfume bottles open. And then like, you know, I met open-minded people in college that like do these things for real. And I was like, I've been doing this my whole life. I've been doing this my whole life, not even knowing what I was doing. It was just like instinct. So I guess when I knew was when I realized that what was coming to me kind of instinctually actually had a practice and a pantheon attached to it. And that was surprising. That surprised me that the goddess was known by thousands of names. And that it wasn't until the veneration of Mary that Christianity was accepted by the masses. Like, they needed her. They needed her. They weren't going to let their holidays go without her. So I can match up the pagan wheel of the year to any holiday you ask me to. The Candlemas in February, even Groundhog's Day, Groundhog's Day, in Easter, you wonder why we're looking at chicks and bunnies? It wasn't because of the cross. It was Ostara, it was the spring equinox, vernal equinox. May Day, 1st of May, Beltane, ancient Celtic fire festival, St. John's Day, summer solstice, the uh, change of power between the Oak King and the uh, Holly King. I could go on. Uh, Lama's Tide, Lugmasa, the Bread Mass, the Loaf Mass, and that carries us into um, September with the um, Autumnal Equinox, also known as uh, Mabon, and then we all still celebrate Halloween with Samhain, um, before it was you know, Halloween. Um, and you all too, we're still celebrating that. We just, we, this is who we all are, I think, in some way. It's like um, a universal consciousness that we step in and out of, that we participate in. So, from ever since, I guess is how I answer that. From ever since. Maybe one last question, if anyone has one. Thank you. This is like really random, but um, do you believe that the Kardashians come from a line of army and witches? <laughs> <laughs> do I, you know, I didn't know that at all. Let's see, what does it mean to be an Armenian witch and how do we come from them? Well, let's see, here's what I know. I know that um, most witches used magical names because of the very, very real threat and fear of persecution. So there probably is not 
a way to prove or disprove that. Mm -hmm. But if we were going to look at that in purely um, like genealogic terms, we're all descended from witches. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have to say, sure. <laughs> You go back you, far enough. I was just wondering if you knew about that because yeah. I, I follow like a lot of accounts that are, you know, witchy that practice yeah, witchcraft and stuff yeah, like that. So, and one of them said like they come from like a line of Armenian witches and that's why they're they have all this power. And then uh, there was like a YouTube video of Chris Jenner um, promoting candles and how like I mean obviously she does candle magic. So awesome. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wow. curious if you had any type of, you know, infor information on that. Um, so. uh, in all honesty, in the spirit of full disclosure, I do not. I, <laughs> that is news to me, and I, I find it really salacious. <laughs> Maybe witches, Kardashians, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look into that. That'll be like my guilty pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> you should watch that YouTube video. Before <laughs> Time book, so you said you had a question. Oh yeah, so I had a question. So I wanted to do a short reading, and there's a couple things that I love to do. One is uh, talk about magic. One is uh, trance journeys and meditations. And then I could also do um, an excerpt from the new book. So then my question is, what do you need? Or what do you want? Trance journey. Trance journey? Yeah. You want a trance journey? Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. I'm ready for that. So I'm going to come over there. Yeah. Okay, so we have uh, volume here. We hear me okay? So this is um, this is a trance journey. So I'm going to ask you um, to listen to my words. I want you to sit comfortably. Um, sometimes people like to close their eyes, that's not mandatory, but if you feel comfortable doing that, um, that's fine. And I just want you to, um, to listen and experience these words in the way that they come to you. You are calm and at peace, sitting comfortably at the base of a tree in a grove. Before you is a sprout, a fresh green shoot forcing its way out of the earth, erupting to receive the light of the sun. It grows rapidly, the tender stem so nourished by its thick primary leaves that the secondary and tertiary leaves appear before you. Rising to meet you, the stem thickens, divides into two stout boughs, which divide again into branches that seem to reach for you, as would a new friend seeking an embrace. The pale green leaves erupt into a burgeoning bouquet. The leaves shift before your eyes, moving into layers, gathering into form. The form appears before you as the face of a man, watching you from within the boughs. He is in and of the tree. In your meditative state, you have summoned the green man, the god of the forest and the consort of the divine goddess. The green man has come with an important message for you. You look into his deep emerald eyes among the shifting leaves, and soon flowers begin to appear on every branch. They recede as quickly as they burst forth, giving way to the fullness of fruit. The fruit hangs ripe and large, and you now see that an apple tree has grown before you. The tree is your teacher and seeks to illuminate your surroundings through the gift of its fruit. The green man emerges, lithe and strong and green as wick wood. He holds an apple before you and requires you to contemplate it. You admire the redness and roundness of the fruit. Using a baleen, the green man cuts the fruit in half across the middle. He reveals to you the pentagram within, the perfect order of seeds that form the witch's emblem. He makes another cut, this one lengthwise through the previous two pieces. Now the apple is in four pieces. He gives you three of the four pieces. You eat them. 
You hear a voice like the rustling wind through leaves. The green man is speaking to you, and his voice is inside your head like a whisper. These pieces you have consumed represent the oceans, where no human, no hoofed, nor horned creature, no bird of the sky, nor any other creature of the land nor air may live. He cuts the final piece of apple in half and gives it to you. You eat it. Again, his voice washes over and through you like a stirring breeze. You have partaken of the body of the goddess, her soaring mountains of rock, her frozen tundra and glacial rivers. Nothing that may sustain you grows there. He cuts the final piece of apple into four slivers and hands three to you. You eat them and hear his words. Nature is wild and untamed. These are her deserts, her marshlands, her dry riverbeds. They exist on their own terms, and they may bring you neither safety, sustenance, nor comfort. There is one tiny sliver of apple left. You watch as the green man gently peels off the skin and places it in your hands. You stare at the delicate, thin strip, the only thing that is left of the fruit. This you do not eat. You hold in your hand all that is left. This is the fertile land that sustains all human life on the planet. Powerful and small, delicate and rich, this bountiful and fine layer that resides over the depths of rock is truly all that you have. All that nourishes you, your ancestors, your beloveds, your descendants, is held in this small and sacred place. Keep it safe. <coughs> In the gathering wind, the green man retreats into the tree. You watch as he dematerializes. The rearranging leaves that formed his features again appear as they did before. His body melds with the tree, arms and legs transfiguring back to bow and branch. Even though you no longer see him, you feel the strength of his presence. He is the spirit of the forest. He does not dwell in any singular place. He is eternal, in and out of time and space. You contemplate the tiny strip of apple peel in your hand. You think of how 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. You picture the mighty oceans, savage mountains, inhospitable deserts, all the beauty and fury that resides in the planet. You think of the small peace he has given you and the full impact washes over you. We ask so much of the earth. We build and plow and pave over and demand here in the quiet place of the green wood. You take a step outside the cycle of planting and reaping, and building, destruction, to accept nature on its own terms. You do not take anything from the forest, but a deeper understanding of the delicate balance upon which we all depend for our survival. Slowly open your eyes and drink in your surroundings. Notice details with new alacrity. Your perception has increased. The earth feels different, and you've put psychic roots into the ground, and the ground has accepted you as part of its vast network. You will feel the presence of life with every step. The sound of crackling leaves, the pulsing life that resides underneath the pavements, the great cycle of life where nothing is wasted. Energy is returned to the roots in perfect balance. You accept this balance and integrate it with every breath for it is yours to keep. Thank you.
So we're doing a signing now for um, Modern Witchcraft Guide to Magical Herbs. Thank you so much to Peter and to Debbie for the um, conversation and to all the wonderful questions and to Strand for hosting us. And um, Merry Solstice and Blessed Yule, and thank you all for coming. Thank you.